thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself just at the very beginning here. I'm senior curriculum lead at Data Camp, and um, Di talked a little bit about me, uh, a little bit about what Data Camp is about, but we're happy to give away free trials as well to you or your colleagues, so please reach out to me if you need to. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the infer package, which is based on uh, tidyverse principles, and I'm going to actually quiz you a little bit on a hypothesis test and see if you can identify the right one, and then we'll build from that to do an example. Okay, so I want to get a sense for kind of who you are as data scientists or statisticians first. So just raise your hand. Who uses hypothesis tests or confidence intervals at least once a week? Okay, so most of you. Good. Uh, not everyone. That's interesting. Okay, uh, who uses the tidyverse at least once a week? Okay, that's more of you. Uh, who has heard of these things? Simulation-based inference, resampling, bootstrapping. Okay, so that's about the same as the tidyverse. Awesome. Okay, so here's my example. So I want you to read through this. I've done some very careful highlighting nicely here to try to help you and assist you in determining which type of test this is. So I'm going to uh, pause for a little bit and let you read that. Okay, and then after this, I'll, I'll ask you what type of question this is, and I'll show you the data that actually comes along with this, which might further assist you in, this, in deciding which type of test this is. And yeah, the slide link will be at the bottom uh, all throughout as well, uh, if you come in late or if you need to come back to it. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you have read that. Okay, that's most of you. Okay, so maybe chat with your neighbor just very briefly. What type of test is this? You have four options. This is very interactive, so please talk to your neighbor just real quick. What type of test is this? Uh, okay, to assist, here's your data. Okay, so what, what's the correct answer? A, B, C, or D? C, okay, so C is the correct answer. Okay, so let's, let's actually do this at R. Okay, so I'm assuming you kind of know the tidyverse. You use ggplot2, you use dplyr. So, all right, so let's do this in R. Let's put in the data argument. Let's specify the x and the y variables. What happens if you try to do this? Error. Okay, that doesn't work, right? So let's say maybe you're used to the formula syntax. You specify the y is on the left-hand side, the uh, x is on the right-hand side. Let's try this. This has to work, right? No, no, okay, that's also an error. That doesn't work. So the right way to do this in R is to use x as the first component as a vector, y as the second component. You can also do ta like table, wrap it in table and get it to work that way. Uh, so you get the answer that way, okay? And then you can uh, look at the help here. Uh, so question mark chi squared dot test, and it will tell you exactly that. So you can also have um, the x or y uh, so X and Y can both be factors. Uh, X can be a vector or a matrix. So this is a little bit confusing. So think about this from a very beginner perspective. They just want to run a chi-squared test, right? They've done de some dplyr. They got some data wrangling uh, skills. They tried to figure this stuff out. Maybe they did some ggplot2. Now they just want to run a chi-squared test to see if this is significant or not. This is pretty intimidating, I think, for a help page. So uh, you can plot this in ggplot2. This is also a little bit of a challenge if you want to actually plot um, what a statistical distribution looks like, but the p-value you can calculate here is around 0.14, okay? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a teaser now. So the infer package does allow you to have the data argument and the formula interface. So this is a nice kind of wrapper for doing chi-square test, um, and then you get a resulting statistic back, you get the degrees of freedom for the chi-square distribution, and you get the resulting p-value. As of yesterday, <laughs> Uh, you can see the date there. Um, the newest version of infer is on CRAN. So everything that I'm going to show you right now is available in 0.3.0. Okay. Okay. So going back to like intro stats, we have the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis here. So there's no association existing in the null hypothesis between these two variables, and then there is an association existing for the alternative hypothesis. Okay. So. Um, most people, if they're taught hypothesis testing or confidence intervals, they don't, you're not really using computation to help you out here. You're doing some sort of assumption on what type of distribution the data holds, 
and then you kind of go forward from there. Uh, in 2011, and in a follow-up blog post in 2014, Alan Downey proposed this diagram. So just as we've seen with the grammar of graphics in ggplot2, uh, this was kind of a really, like, oh, wow, hypothesis tests do kind of fall in this framework when I first saw this as well. So Alan Downey has this, he's a, compu he's a computer scientist uh, in the US, and he provided this framework. And I started to think about this, and I started to realize that, yeah, almost all hypothesis tests kind of fall in this framework. Okay, so the really tricky step, if you look at this, uh, in my opinion, is this model of H0 and the simulated data down in the bottom left corner there. I think everything else kind of follows a pretty natural flow. You can use dplyr, you could use ggplot2 um, to get your test statistic and feed in the data in that sort of way. Okay, so the tricky part. So let's actually do some permutation testing here and figure out what that model of H0 might look like. So the tricky step, like I said, is modeling null hypothesis. How do we simulate data assuming the null hypothesis is true? So we want to build some sort of null distribution um, with the null hypothesis being that there is no association between the two variables. So the important question here to think about is what might the sample data look like that I showed you at the very beginning? What might that look like if the null hypothesis is true, if there is no association between those two variables? So I'm going to go back just a little bit here and think about what the actual properties are of the original sample that we collected. So in terms of just counts in each one of the columns. So uh, for complete follow, we have 76 and so on and so on in each of those different six groups. Okay, that's the original sample. Uh, there's also a fantastic package by uh, Sam Perky, the janitor package, uh, that gives you a nice little table. So you can really easily see things like that. Uh, okay, so if you want to think about how we actually do this, assuming the null hypothesis is true, we're going to shuffle one variable in, uh, across all the other values of the other variable. That's exactly what we've done here, okay? So stop type is shuffled across vehicle type. And then we see that the actual cells inside have changed uh, in a couple of spots. So we don't have 76 anymore, we have 79. So now we can compare what the original looked like with what we see in our permutation. And we see that they're uh, exactly the same across the row and column totals, uh, but we do have some differences inside. Okay, so that's one permutation. Uh, so where are we now in this step? Well, we've done the hard part. We've modeled the null hypothesis. We've simulated some data. What type of test statistic are we going to build here? Uh, this is an interesting choice of test statistic name. This is the chi-squared test statistic, right? It's a chi-squared test. Uh, so you can look at Wikipedia what this actually is. It's really just a measure of how far we expect the data to be from the null hypothesis. And you can do this in two different ways. So in the infer package, we have chi-square underscore stat. That's just a wrapper to pull out that statistic. Uh, or you can do dollar sign statistic and get that chi-square value of 3.95. Okay, so for the permuted data, so this, that was for the original data. For the permuted data, the statistic is 1.41, somewhere around there. If we did another permutation, we get a different test statistic. So here we get 0.36. So this is very, like, when I was teaching introductory statistics, this was just, like the buildup that I would show students. We do this over and over again. And I would say, well, what if we did this a thousand times, say? If you do this a thousand times, you get something that looks like this with a thousand different simulated test statistics. So the distribution of multiple repetitions, those 1,000 permuted data, uh, if you do the geom density on this, looks like this. That's actually pretty similar to what the traditional method was with chi-square. Okay, so these relate really nicely. So that was for 1,000, if you did this for 10,000, you'd probably get closer and closer to what the actual distribution looks like. Okay, so this is a really nice way to teach um, students that don't have a math background or they don't really understand a lot of the central limit theorem, those sorts of properties. You can just use permutation to help build up those ideas and simulation-based methods. So that kind of helps us uh, bridge into the objectives of the infer package. So before I started data camp, I was an academic. I was trying to teach statistical inference to students that were at the very beginner level, so they were social scientists or criminal justice majors. They never thought they were ever going to do anything in R. They were really good at dplyr and ggplot2, but they were really struggling with statistical inference. And so I worked with some colleagues on building this infer package. Uh, and it's just uh, using the same framework that the tidyverse provides, but to think about it from a statistical inference perspective. So really there's four main objectives. You get a data frame in, so your data set here, the car, Scott, car stop data, you compose your tests and intervals with pipes, 
and the code is very readable as you go along as much as possible. And then we also are going to unite those computational perspectives like simulation-based inference with the approximation-based methods that people are usually taught with the distributional assumptions. And then, like I said, reading a chain of infer code should be very similar to what the actual inferential procedure looks like. So we have five main infer verbs, and I'm going to walk through them with you here. So this kind of creates a statistical inference pipeline. So you have your original data. This is very similar to what you saw with Ellen Downey's um, diagram. And then you specify what your response variable is and what your explanatory variable is using the formula notation. So at the very beginning, you set that up. Then you go to modeling your null hypothesis via the hypothesize function, specifying are you testing for there being independence between two variables? Do you have a point null hypothesis? Uh, there's some different options there. Then after you have done that, you're going to simulate the data assuming that the null hypothesis is true using the generate function. After you've generated all those different samples, you're going to calculate a test statistic for each one of those samples using to the, the calculate function. Okay, so this is creating that kind of verbiage behind how things work. And after you have all of those calculated statistics, like we saw, we, you had a thousand different statistics, you could visualize them using the visualize function. Okay, so visualize is really just a wrapper on ggplot2. Uh, you could definitely just use ggplot2. You don't have to use visualize, but you'll see later on maybe some nice reasons for using visualize, especially if you want to do both method, methods at exactly the same time, computational and theoretical. Okay, so that's a hypothesis test. What happens if you want to do a confidence interval? Well, you can kind of think about this. The only thing that really changes here is you're no longer assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So you just drop the hypothesize verb from your pipeline, and then maybe you want to get a standard error out. Okay? So uh, this is what the verbs look like. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Connecting to my own internet, that's funny. Um, so this is what the pipeline actually looks like. Uh, so car stop, then we specify that we have stop type versus vehicle type. We hypothesize that the verbs are independent. We generate a thousand of them uh, using permutation as our type, and then we calculate the chi-square test statistic, and we get something that looks like this. Okay, so back to our original example, we can then pipe that into visualize, and we get a histogram that looks like this. Then we can use, this is a brand new function in the package, get p-value. You specify what the observed statistic is, and here you, if you want to calculate an observed statistic, that's really just skipping that generate and hypothesize step. So you just go directly from specify to calculate, and you get from your original data what the observed statistic is. Here we want to do a chi-squared test, so we're going to go direction greater, everything to the right of that, and we get about the same value here, 0.13. If you want to further visualize this, in the visualize function, you can pass in those exact same arguments, and it shades things nicely. So here it's everything greater with a, a dark red line at the observed test statistic. Okay, so what if we actually wanted to think about what, how does this compare to what we actually saw from the theoretical distribution? So by default, you get method equals kind of that simulation-based uh, way, but you could say method equals both, and that will allow you to put what the actual theoretical distribution looks like uh, right on top of what we actually saw with our simulated values. And uh, one of the last things that we added here is a warning, so to really make sure that people are checking to make sure that the assumptions are met for the theoretical distribution. So we're not doing that for you. We're assuming that you're actually going to go and do that. So you get a warning if you try to do that here. OK, so what's to come with infer? Well, right now, if you go back, there's um, in the calculate step, it says stat equals, and there's just a quote. So it just does um, stat equals quote mean, stat equals diff in means, stat equals chi-square. Um, that's not really um, kind of a generalized nice thing. So what we'd like to have instead is calculate trim mean, where the trim mean is actually just a function that's being passed in. So you can really do a hypothesis test for any type of statistic that you would like after you have done that generation of multiple samples. Uh, there's a lot more to-dos that I've added to the Netlify uh, webpage, and so please go check those out. If you're ever interested in helping us build this, we are definitely open for that. We'd love a pull request. Um, in addition, if you play with this and you get things that aren't necessarily working nicely, uh, feature requests and bug reports, uh, please do that on our web page there. Uh, if you want more info information and practice, so like I said, there's infer.netlify.com. Um, as we develop things and kind of work on the development branch, we also do have infer-dev if you really want to see what the cutting edge things that we're doing and working on is there. Um, there's a lot of different vignettes and articles that kind of walk through a lot of different types of hypothesis tests and confidence intervals that you can do. Um, I also wrote a, a textbook, I co-authored a textbook 
uh, moderndive.com. So probably at the end of this month, all of infer is going to be fully implemented. So the second half of the book is all on statistical inference. So there's going to be lots of examples uh, there as well. Um, I work for DataCamp, so this actually came about through some instructors building data camp courses. So there's three courses currently that use infer. They're all linked there, and there's one more that's coming. Uh, Max might talk about this in a little bit, but this, the infer package is also going to be part of a tidy models meta package. So please keep an eye on that as a web page comes out pretty soon. Um, so uh, that's it for me. Thanks so much for attending. I have plenty of hex stickers, so if you would love to get some hex stickers for infer, or data camp, or modern dive, uh, please come up and uh, ask me. Thanks a bunch. Um, so we have time for questions if... Oh, sure. Okay. Yes, Miles. Okay, so just to reiterate your question, make sure this is right. So uh, I use the magic number like a thousand uh, in there, and, Ma and Miles is asking, you know, are there some sort of recommendations in terms of how many you should do uh, something like that? Um, I'm sure there are. I am not aware of those. So what I actually do is usually I'll just do 10,000, and in my experience, 10,000 will take a few seconds to go through, but that pretty much kind of gets a lot of the noise out and kind of gets um, things going okay. But 1,000 is like my default if I only just wanted a couple seconds, but I don't have a good sense for uh, how many you should actually do or what defaults should be set. Okay, let's thank uh, Chester one more time.